Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Donut of Destiny, the podcast on all things cardiac CT for anyone interested in cardiovascular imaging. My name is Praveen Ranganath, and I'm a radiologist in Dallas, Texas. On today's episode, we add another installment to our series on building a cardiac CT program. It is my absolute privilege to be joined by a titan in the field of cardiac CT, Dr. Ricardo Curry. Dr. Curry is a cardiovascular radiologist based out of Florida, a past president of SCCT, author of over 200 original science publications, a co-founder of the CADRADS reporting system, and a truly world-renowned expert in the field of cardiac imaging. Ricardo, welcome onto the podcast. Praveen, it's a real pleasure to be here to contribute to this podcast and to share some knowledge. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. Of course. Thank you, Ricardo. You know, many of our listeners out there are certainly familiar with your innumerable contributions to the field of cardiac CT. I want to get an idea as to what you think your major highlights have been along your journey in cardiac CT. Sure. I think it's, it's a good and, and, and difficult question to, to highlight for the get-go. But if I could summarize, like first I had an, a phenomenal first stage uh, when I was at uh, Mass General in Boston and, and, and Harvard for not only my initial phase with you know, a lot of research, publications, and helping to build an initial clinical program at MGH and be able, you know, really have the privilege to work with uh, so many cardiac imagers, cardiologists, radiologists, so, so it was a wealth of knowledge. And for that, I think one of the things, so, so going back to the highlight and the second phase was really the transition to, to, to Miami Baptist and the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute and Baptist Health, where I have been for the past 15 years now. So really five years at Boston MS General and the past 15 years here in Miami. And also using the backbone and foundation at MGH and be able to translate to a large and a strong clinical program, but is still involved with clinical research. So, so with that background, I believe, you know, the main highlights and contributions, I think really the acute chest pain evaluation, validation, and implementation that is started in Boston at Mass General with the leadership of Udo Hoffman, a lot of collaborators, Sunny Abara, Maris Ferencic, you know, so many hard to name all, but but we had a tremendous group that validated Romy Cat 1, Romy Cat 2, that I had the privilege to be part of that. And really, during that transition, being able to implement that acute chest pain program at Miami Baptist Cardiac and Vascular Institute, I think was, was really important, really moving from research to clinical practice, which we'll discuss more of building a program. So I think that's one of the highlights. The second highlight and has been like in, in stress perfusion imaging and also like plaque imaging. So a lot of research and presentations in that front, validating stress perfusion cardiac CT, both the initial validations and comparing with cardiac MR, with uh, nuclear medicine, with invasive angiography and CTFFR, and the plaque imaging studies validating CT with IVAs and other imaging modalities. And I think the third and more recent, like the past five years, five plus years, has been like the structure reporting, really a need for clear, concise reporting and recommendations, which has been the result of CADRADS, the first version, and the recent developed version. So I think if I could summarize the highlights, I think those, those are like the three major highlights in my career. Unbelievable. I'm a true monumental journey along the way. And you've seen cardiac CT through its growth from maybe not its infancy, but its nascency up until today. It's robust practice across the world. So really cool seeing each of these different parts of your life and how you've contributed to it in your career. Let's focus in on where you are at right now. You had mentioned you're practicing in Miami. Can we get a little more detail about your particular practice? For example, is this a predominantly academic, a private, or a hybrid practice? Uh, how many different facilities are you currently servicing? And 
what sort of overall volume are you seeing in terms of either patients per day, scans per day, et cetera? Sure, sure. I, I would describe as a hybrid practice. We have an academic component with Florida International University and Baptist Health, which we have a fellowship program in cardiac imaging and a future residency program. We have a, a residency and fellowship in interventional radiology, but moving into also diagnostic radiology, and we have a fellowship in, in cardiac imaging. So we have an academic component, and we are part of a private practice, which is Radiology Associates of South Florida, which provides exclusive services to Baptist Health of South Florida. So in terms of hospitals and facilities, we cover eight hospitals, six in South Florida and two in the Naples region. And we cover a number of outpatient imaging facilities for the practice, but I would say three for dedicated cardiac. So we use a number of uh, CT scanners. So really, we have a large operation. We started with a couple, like two, three hospitals, and that expanded over time. In terms of number of scanners, we have several scanners, so probably like 10 plus CT scanners supporting that operation, both in the hospital and the outpatient setting, and different vendors. So multi-vendor, we use predominantly Revolution CT scanners, but we also have Philips and we have worked with other vendors. One of our facilities, we have Canon, and we work with Siemens as well. We do, for cardiac CT, we do about 20 to 25 studies a day, a predominant coronary CT angel, and also, you know, cardiac CT for morphology. And then we have the, you know, TAVRs and vascular imaging, which is in addition to that. But for cardiac CT, a range of 20 to 25, and some, some days which are busy, more, more than 30 studies. I think that that is a good background in, in terms of the practice and the services that we offer. Yeah, definitely. It gives us a good pulse on what your day-to-day cardiac CT workflow looks like. And obviously, you've said you've been there for almost 15 years now. I presume when you first joined, the volume was not as robust as it is today. Did you join before the cardiac CT program had been established and therefore you built it from the ground up? And if so, what sort of obstacles did you reach along the way when trying to expand it to its current very robust state? Sure, sure. I I was actually very pleased of uh, joining a practice and and a healthcare system that they already had expertise in, in cardiac imaging. So my my great friends and colleagues, Jack Zifor, that has led, you know, a leader in nuclear medicine and nuclear cardiology and has started our cardiac CT program with uh, Warren Janowitz, which partner with Arthur Agaston to, to develop the Kelso score, the Agaston Janowitz score, AJ score, and also Dr. Constantino Payne, who is a leader in vascular imaging and has always been involved in cardiac imaging. So when, when I joined, we had a cardiac program. It was incipient. Uh, we were doing, in terms of numbers, we were doing, I would say, probably like few two three studies a day but there there was a program so so was was good there was like a rich tradition in the group of being strong in in both cardiovascular imaging and intervention and that was one one of the reasons that really attracted me to this place and and that served as a as a platform to grow Awesome. And today, who are your readers in terms of trainees versus faculty, radiologists, cardiologists, both? So, so we have mainly like radiologists and they are fully trained in cardiovascular imaging. I think we're pleased that we have a very robust team of fellowship trained cardiac imagers. You know, the audience may, may know several, but one battle, Chris Maroulis, Carl Saig, Warren Janowitz was part of our team, Jack Z for Tino Pena. So uh, many cardiac imagers are like really involved with the field with SCCT and other, other organizations. Excellent. And 
In your opening, you discussed a couple of very unique concepts within cardiac CT, namely acute chest pain evaluations and CT perfusion. Do you integrate some of those practices within your current group or are you planning to in the future? Yeah, great question. So the acute chest pain evaluation, it it was really a major effort that, you know, looking back, we are very proud of uh, what we have now. So so we, we have been able to fully implement in clinical practice that we have, and it was the early backbone to really grow the volume for cardiac CT offering coronary CT angiography in a chest pain pathway. So it was, was a lot of work to set up, working with emergency physicians, hospitalists, cardiologists, setting up the clinical pathways and implementing coronary CTA uh, as one of the main tools uh, to, for assessment of those patients. And we started in one hospital and we were able to expand and now covering uh, like six, seven hospitals with well-defined criteria. So coronary CTA and chest pain in the ER, fully implemented and operational. And we cover seven days a week, Mondays to Fridays from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. And then in the weekends from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So covering most of the hours for acute chest pain. For stress perfusion uh, CT, we had implemented, we had several moving to Miami. We had, we validated a new technology, but we had implemented in clinical trials stress CT perfusion. And clinically, in a very, I would say, sporadic basis, so we had you know, very unique scenarios that we can offer, you know, a combined evaluation with a stress CTP and CTA. But I would say the volume is, it's, it's a small, definitely like the perfusion is still, I think, similar to the rest of the country led by nuclear cardiology in a smaller scale with a stress perfusion cardiac MR. I do want to dive a little bit deeper into perfusion. But before that, many of us have attempted to or are in the process of implementing coronary CT programs for our acute chest pain patients. And full credit to my emergency department colleagues, we often worry about concepts behind scope creep, where indications for exams tend to go further and further and wider and wider. And I wanted to get your insight as to how you approach the indications for acute chest pain-based coronary CT evaluations, particularly with such a, a large program covering so many institutions across many days of the week, how is it that we keep the ship right, I guess is the best way to put it? Absolutely. Great question, Praveen. You know, the short answer is it's always a works in progress, but I will share like some ingredients that have been very helpful to try to really apply a coronary CTA to the right patient population in in the right clinical setting. But the key ingredients, uh, having a multidisciplinary collaboration is very important. So that was helpful when we set up that program in terms of having emergency department physicians, hospitalists, cardiologists, and the imaging team together. We had hospital support. There were like major needs, uh, longer length of stay for chest pain, increased costs. So, so along the way, we were able by implementing that program that we could really had an impact in, in length of stay, in decreasing total cost for the hospital. And also we had data published in the clinical setting of impacting and decreasing major adverse cardiac events. But that multidisciplinary team, I think, is very important. And depending on the setting, you know, having your ER team, you know, hospitalists, we we have like hospitals of different sizes. And in certain hospitals, just to be more specific, we do coronary CT angel just from our chest pain center unit. Uh, so the patients are admitted from the ER, they go to the chest pain center unit, and that's where you know the referrals come and it's ordered only by hospitalists or, or, or cardiologists. Other hospitals, smaller facilities, we expanded and we have the clinical pathway, uh, which is very important. And 
be within that clinical pathway, we open for ER physicians and also we expand it to facilities that we don't have PCI, we don't have cat labs and, and PCI capabilities to be have a little more broader indication. Regarding you know how we don't have overutilization, that's the iterative process. So so the multidisciplinary meetings they, they help. We were fortunate to have a team from Baptist that we track utilization with the CAD RADS implementation. You know, just just sharing. I think is really it helped us to map our database of coronary CTAs. So so by implementing CAD RADS many years ago, it's really easy to go back and uh, for for our data analytics team to say hey, how many CAD RADS three, how many CAD RADS four we had, moderate, severe stenosis, and what is kind of the other tasks that they had, and are we you know, overutilizing or not, and, you know, proportion of negative cases. So that has helped in sharing that data back. So I think those those were like some ingredients. So if I briefly summarize that multidisciplinary team, uh, establishing a clinical pathway where CT fits the criteria and indications and contraindications and disseminating that. There's obviously deviations, but that's the iterative process. And the third point, like the CAD RADS has really helped of going back, mapping, seeing, you know, the proportion of the different CAD RADS categories and seeing if we are overutilizing or not and, and the downstream testing from those CAD RADS based on the CT engine. And Ricardo, real quick before we jump to perfusion, is there a ske- set schedule with which you perform your QA for your program, either for acute chest pain specifically or the entire program in general, or is it a QA more fluid? So we have a monthly QA meeting, and we have recent, after the CATRADS implementation, we have a monthly dashboard, if you will, that we are able to track all the cases that were performed for coronary CTA, the breakdown by CADRADS. So we know CADRADS 0, 1 and 2, non-obstructive discharge, 3 and 4 and 5 and the 3 moderate, 4 severe and 5 occlusion. Those cases, we know which patients went to the CAT lab and which went to the nuclear. And then the QA, we review the CTA versus CAT correlation. So that has been very helpful and also for feedback for, for the cardiac imagers in order to always, always like keep learning, optimizing, not overcall. I think is is less of the undercalling, but I think that, that that QA helps a lot. Awesome. Super helpful. Let's talk a little bit about perfusion. I know that we had discussed the research implementation and the robust data from the research realm supporting stress CT perfusion in in a variety of forms, either single phase or dynamic, whatever it may be. But both at your institution as well as my own, we do not currently perform CT perfusion. And trying to stay as diplomatic as possible, is there a future for stress CT perfusion in the cardiac CT world? Very, very important question. I think Again, the short answer, I believe there is. I think there is robust data and many investigators have contributed. Actually, the the clinical ut- utilization of a CT perfusion, stress CT perfusion, it's, it's significantly higher outside of the U.S. We see our colleagues in Asia and, and Europe performing more, particularly in Asia. It's interesting with, you know, more and more implementation of ischemia-based evaluation with AI, if it's with CT, FFR, CT, CT, FFR, or other ways to detect ischemia-based lesion-specific ischemia. I think that's, that's you know, the, if you will, competition or complementary. The CT perfusion, the hurdles that we had, number one, reimbursement. And the number two is how to make it work in practice and regarding workflow. When we did clinical research, the data was very strong. Also, there is like the room utilization, but you would be able to get in one setting the information of the perfusion with ischemia 
uh, with rigor denosal injection. And we use more the static approach. So the full volumetric 16 centimeter full heart coverage, but a static approach like summarizing the data is there clinical implementation there is a lot of hurdles you can get paid for the stress component you get paid only for one study not for two despite you are doing two studies one for the coronary cta slash rest perfusion and the second for the stress CT perfusion so i think we do need support from advocacy and reimbursement for that second component i think that's critical if we want to have expanded clinical utilization because there's a lot of data supporting that and how you make it work in in the workflow with regards to workflow i wanted to see if there was anything relatively unique about your large hybrid practice in terms of either applications or protocol software or any general workflow principle that you're applying right now that may be helpful for our listeners to hear? Sure. I think, you know, beginning with uh, uh, protocols, I think that that's very important. The image quality, the acquisition, the tech QA, adhering to the protocols, both for medication, beta blocker, nitroglycerin. So, so like just giving some specifics, we have nurses uh, supporting our operations in every facility that they are giving beta blocker and a nitro and there is a, a like specific criteria that they follow the cardiac imager is always available as a backup for questions and we always have one physician on site but the cardiac imaging may be in the in the site that we have the highest volume so so the nursing medication prep patient prep then the tech and the protocol, it's really critical, particularly expanding the program, the tech education, and more so, you know, after the pandemic where, where we see issues with the staffing, that's critical, the training and the education and the iterative process regarding optimizing. And also, to be honest, technology helps. So having more advanced CT technology hardware, it definitely helps to increase, have higher image quality, accuracy, and so forth. But I would say that having well-qualified technologies and protocols and nurses in places, it trumps the technology. But the combination of both is, is very powerful. Regarding software and workflow, also we we saw that like a tipping point, our program was growing. And nowadays, we cannot live without is a dedicated 3D lab. So a 3D lab has been critical in centralizing the 3D reconstructions, in preparing those 3D reconstructions, and providing also a level of QA to the tax on site, and also to even going to the point of you know doing quantification of calcium score, performing some basic measurements, for example, for like pulmonary vein, anatomy for left atrial appendage, and ways that you can pre-populate those numbers into the report. So all of those workflow steps and efficiency are critical as you grow your program. And that also has been served as a foundation for us to test like new software and new AI tools. Ricardo, I wanted to peel a couple layers back behind that three-dimensional laboratory idea because, you know, I've noticed in my own practice, and I'm sure others out there have noticed the same, it's quite resource intensive to put together a three-dimensional laboratory. Sometimes the technologists may not work directly for or with us, but rather at a separate institution, which it's quite difficult to coordinate not only education, but also creation of these resources, such as a 3D lab. Furthermore, there are a lot of options for remote three-dimensional laboratory capabilities. Wanted to get your idea from the perspective of someone starting a program, how to get a three-dimensional laboratory idea off the ground or when to recognize that utilizing third-party three-dimensional applications may be more helpful than trying to put in one's own resources? Absolutely. I think that's a great question. 
And uh, it, it's really depending on the size and the scope of, you know, your hostel, your program, your outpatient setting. But, you know, if I would have to go back and even in the initial states and, and a suggestion for, for members, it makes a lot of sense, particularly in the beginning. It's, it's hard to have an ROI of, you know, developing your own lab and depending on the size and the scope. So using outside help, it's a big step to like really ramp up and grow and not be a limiting step because that that's another hurdle. But in, in times that we know that, you know, there is more demand in imaging than capacity. So there is a overall shortage of physicians we need to tap in, in all the resources available, either internally or externally. Excellent. Uh, thus far, we've discussed the past and the present, and I want to focus a little more now on the future. Could you talk to us about some areas of growth, either within your own practice or for your own personal interest, that you're planning on exploring and how you plan on accomplishing these goals? Sure. A great question. And in the past few years, we have been really focused in population health. So with you know the collaboration of many, we had the, the privilege of having Kuru and Nasser with us at, at Baptist Health and, and being one of the leaders in preventive cardiology and, and the field of calcium score and, and prevention. But we, we were able in collaboration with uh, Kuren with our cardiology team, Dr. Jonathan Fialco and others, Ted Feldman, really built the Miami Heart Study. A lot of support from Jack Ziefer from a healthcare system standpoint. Uh, so we, we were able to develop and publish now the Miami Heart Study, which was looking at our own Baptist health employee population and could we have an impact on that population, which was really asymptomatic patients, but with risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Uh, so we were able to study about 2,500 asymptomatic patients, publish the results of the Miami Heart Study, and including full cardiovascular assessment, blood work, carotid ultrasound, IMT, a calcium score, coronary CTA. So really an interesting database. And we have seen, I, I, I think, just with the Swedish trial in asymptomatic patients, I think it was 25,000 patients. More recent, the data from Denmark showing that the presence of plaque and non-obstructive disease uh, has a critical importance and obstructive disease, but the detection of both non-obstructive and obstructive disease in asymptomatic patients. So I do see... And if you if you couple that, if you couple that with AI tools that are being out there, being developed and validated and own validation for full plaque quantification, not only the calcified plaque, but the non-calcified plaque and full plaque burden, I think really is a very intriguing field that will expand and is expanding the scope of coronary CTA and really into that front of moving from risk stratification to early detection of coronary artery disease and personalized medicine based on the individual plaque assessment. I see that as a major area that cardiac CT will be playing a major role. And also a note that we are beginning to see a trend of many pharma studies using imaging and coronary CT angio as an endpoint of testing new drugs. So I think with the technology continue to evolve, with the AI tools continue to evolve and being validated, it will be quite interesting that that a major component in expanding uh, the use of CT. Excellent. Ricardo, conversation thus far has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you again. Do you have any final thoughts before we close? No, Praveen. I think, you know, congratulations on this podcast. There was definitely a, a niche to really disseminate the information, keep up the great work, and um, has been a pleasure being part of your podcast. 
Thank you, Ricardo. I really appreciate you coming on. For our listeners out there, of course, thank you as well for tuning in. Remember, if you like what you hear from us on the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. Once again, this is the Donut of Destiny. Cheers. Cheers.